Hello everyone, welcome to the Geo Ecologist. I am Dr. Krishnanand and with this video we are going to start our series for UPSC Preliminary Examination 2024. As you are aware that we have announced already that we are going to do a series on geography and environment topics which are going to be very important. So this video is in collaboration with our partners the SHIELD IS where I am also a faculty member and our team has prepared a special material for you all and which you can also get it from our telegram channel which we have given the link in the description and for more courses of Shield IS, you can go to their website directly. The link is also given in the description. And while the lectures are on, we'll be also talking more on how to approach UPSC in future. So now, before going ahead, there is one request to all of you that please share these videos to maximum people who are appearing for UPSC prelims this year so that it is helpful for all the aspirants. So now let's begin with it. So this series that we are doing on preliminary examination special is going to be covered every day at 9 p.m. onwards from today. And the details of our collaborators, that is the Shield IS, you can go to this particular website and explore their content and their courses as well. So now this material has been carefully drafted and constructed as per the needs of UPSC exams in the upcoming prelims 2024. So here is the section geography and environment that we are going to cover and one by one we'll be looking into the topics that are going to be important. So it's recommended that you carry your pen and paper and also keep making short notes from the video for revision as well as if you want this material we have given the link for our telegram channel in description you can download this material from there as well and also you can go to the website shieldis.in there this material is available for free download as well now let's go to the first topic that is geographical features so here the first topic is iceberg so one potential question from iceberg seems pertinent because this is always in news considering global climate change so the term iceberg if you see here it refers to chunks of ice larger than five meters so so this is one point to remember larger than five meters or 16 feet is the first thing and also small icebergs are known as bergy bits and growlers. So these two terms you can write in your paper, bergy bits and growlers are two important terms and they are also very dangerous obviously for navigation when you see, right? And North Atlantic has a lot of these small bits of icebergs called bergy bits and also growlers which are there surrounding the other areas as well in Antarctica as well if you observe. Now icebergs form and they go to certain places. So what is their life cycle? So icebergs are huge chunks of ice, which is formed after the process of calving or breaking off from the main glacier or ice shelves or a large iceberg. Now, because it is also mobile, it travels with ocean currents. Here is the catch word that it will travel along with ocean currents and sometime they smash up against the shoreline as well or getting caught in shallow waters as well. Now, when an iceberg reaches warm waters, what happens to it? the new climate attacks it from all sides and then it starts to melt. So iceberg on the surface where warm air melts snow and ice into pools. These pools of icebergs are called melt ponds. So here is another catch word called melt ponds that you can remember. Now what's here in further to look into is why icebergs are important and why was it in news. So icebergs are important because it poses danger to ships, that one aspect, but also it's one of the indicators of climate change, right? So if you observe here in Newfoundland, what you see, Titanic 1912 is the famous example where it broke down. And you observe here further that US National Ice Center uses satellite data to monitor these particular icebergs near Antarctica as well. Now, Look, here is the catch that almost 4,000 square kilometer, the Antarctic iceberg called A23A, right? Remember this A23A, which is roughly three times the size of New York City, actually broke away, right? From where? From this flischner ron ice shelf in 1986 and started to travel where already there was a Soviet research station, which is not there anymore. So this is near the base of Weddell Sea. Right, and Weddell Sea is one of the sea near Antarctica, so must look into the map here. Now, why do scientists study iceberg? One of the reason is this particular breakup because it gives you a clue about the process of ice shelf collapse itself. And also it's a thing that is telling us about warming climate. 
and oceanographers follow these icebergs because of the cold fresh water they contribute and then changes in ocean salinity and density and biologists look into this icebergs because surrounding areas seems to be having plankton fish and other sea life so these are the three arenas that you observe here why is it important so this is first topic then let's go to the arctic region now specifically that one question from arctic region could be a potential so let's look into the arctic region a little so if you observe this particular 66 degree and half latitude here right so this region is your arctic region right inside arctic you observe the major area here is under denmark's control that is greenland and then you see the north pole here and the seas around it and the islands around it so what is important here has been written you can observe here in the material the monthly average temperature in the arctic is below 10 degrees c throughout the year that's the first thing and forest line follows temperature defined areas the forest line is a narrow line but a zone of tens of kilometers here and remember the conifers and tundra is the vegetation observing here so this area has some particular demarcations where you see that forest which is tundra is also available predominantly you'll observe that near the arctic circle now what is important here the permafrost this word so this, anytime this permafrost word comes in the scholar is alexander von humboldt right who is the person behind this permafrost conceptuality? It's Humboldt. So remember, this is one thing. And then this permafrost areas where you see Russian Arctic, right? They have a particular delineation and ice coverage here is looked for at least two consecutive years. And then it is again made another line. So if you observe, this is under constant monitoring and sea ice is highest in February and March and lowest in September. So this March to September, six month cycle, as you can see. And culturally defined Arctic covers homelands of northern indigenous people as well. So that's also important. Now, some interesting facts have been given here. So as you can read, about 10, 12 facts are there here. So one of the important fact here is that Arctic Ocean has the widest continental shelf of all the oceans. This one point you can remember at least. And Arctic sea ice has diminished from 6 to 1 million square right from 1999 to 4 and 3 million square in 2019. So roughly this is where we are worried about the diminishing ice sea here in Arctic, right? Now look into this boreal forests, the northern forest that we say. So tundra, taiga, all those areas you observe. Arctic about 17% of global land area representing largest natural forest of the world and there are a lot of problems with again this forest and wilderness as well. So seven of the world's 10 largest wilderness areas are located in Arctic. And what is here? United States Geological Survey estimates 30% of the world's undiscovered natural gas lies in Arctic. And that's why you see there is an international, you know, commotion where you see control over Arctic. And 70% of all undiscovered oil is roughly supposed to be in Bering Sea region near Russia and then Devis Strait of Greenland and Canada. So that is the area under watch that we should look into. Then you have something more from the glaciers. So here you look into the glaciers are very important for us. They help us in reflecting excess heat back and also keeps the planet cooler. While you observe, there are certain things to be looked here. Today, 10% of land area of Earth is covered with glacial ice. Almost 90% is in Antarctica and 10% is the green ice cap, right? Green line ice cap. So these are the certain facts and figures if you observe. Now, difference between sea ice and glacier is clearly given here. So this is glacier in Antarctica. This is sea ice in Finland. So if you observe here carefully, what is the difference? So the glaciers melt because the water is stored on land. The runoff significantly increases the amount of water. And this is leading to global sea rise, right? So this is one part. While sea ice, on the other hand, is often compared to ice cubes in glass of water, something like that you can observe. And it's not directly changing the level of water. Right. So this is something, a clear cut difference. Now, effects of melting glaciers on sea level rise, we all know. But what are the facts and figures? So it's leading to a lot of sea level rise. And what's happening with Greenland ice? It's become four times faster, the disappearance. Right. And 20 percent of current sea level rise is contributed by this Greenland ice. And then you observe if the entire Greenland melted, it would lead to global rise of sea levels by 20 feet. And that's a worrisome figure. So that's one aspect from here in climate change and glacier aspect. 
Now, Arctic is warming twice as fast as anywhere on the Earth. That's another thing written here. And polar vortex is actually something which is to be looked into. So a question from polar vortex can also come. And polar vortex video is already there on our channel. So if you want details of polar vortex, you can watch that video separately. But a question from this aspect can be there because polar vortex is not now running inside its territories, but it's also running outside. And that's because of the climate change aspects and a lot of research is going around it. So you see extreme cooling and extreme heating. Both the things are there in North American territory as well and in Europe as well. So heat waves and you observe this particular events where polar vortex is entering inside the continental areas leading to a lot of dipping in temperatures. Right, so these are things which are happening and now come to glacial lake outburst flood, which could be another area where you should look into. So South Lonak Lake, if you remember, right, at 17,000 feet. So that was the news and experienced a rupture as a result of continuous rainfall. So excessive rainfall in Himalayan region and rupturing of this lake. Now coming to here, which areas are here? So you see Tista River, which is impacting four districts of Sikkim. So you have Mangan, Gangtok, Pakyong and Namchi. So four areas and this flooding also caused the Chungthang Hydro Dam in Sikkim on Tista River to breach. So this was the thing here. And South Lonak Lake in North Sikkim is situated 5200 meters above sea level. And what is a GLOF? Basically, we have also made a video on GLOF. You can look into disaster management videos. You'll find a GLOF video there. So basically, Glacial Lake Outburst Flood is what? A glacier is actually melting and the water is deposited here. And if this moraine area is blocking the channel, so here a lake is constructed called Moraine Dam Lake. But after this is full, it is breaking and spilling out, causing flash floods. So this is where Moraine Dam lakes break up when if you have excessive rainfall in this region someday. So this is a natural glove. But if you observe, we have created a reservoir here, then it's also human induced glove that we observe, right? So Himalayan region has a lot of this and glove mitigation strategies have been provided for you to read. So identification of risk lakes, adoption of technology, channeling potential floods, uniform construction of codes, right? Early warning systems and human capacity building resource, right? So you observe these things are there. Then there are certain things called paleo proxies. Now, what is this paleo proxy? So remember, short for paleo climate proxies or paleo environmental proxies. Now, this is something to be covered as well. So these are indicators or records used by scientists to reconstruct the past climate change. So in simple way, reconstruction of past climate change. And this is called paleo climate proxies. So these proxies are typically derived from physical, biological or chemical processes that respond to changes in temperature and climatic factors over a long period of time. So for example, what we do, we study the ice cores under this. So ice cores drilled from the glaciers and polar sheets contain trapped air bubbles, isotropic compositions, right? So isotopic composition will tell us that what was the condition of atmosphere during that time period? What was the greenhouse concentration at that time period? Right. So then you have tree rings for the study, coral records, pollen records. All these are very important ones. Right. So remember this paleo proxies could be one area where a question could come from. Now, what are the limitations here? So limitations of paleo proxies, if you observe this uniformity principle may not actually be true. Right. Then what you observe can only record temperature anomalies or time scales of centuries or thousands of years, making it daily temperature estimations impossible that's one aspect right especially for the ocean and lake sediments areas then temperature proxies provide only local or regional estimates right then global estimates based on averaging all local proxies have even been uncertainties that's another not so reliable thing now come to avalanche now this activity has also now gone into higher scale because of the climate change and impact of global warming, rapid snow melting on inclined slope and leading to disastrous situation. So this is triggered by natural forces. So you see precipitation, wind, drifting snow, right, temperature. But human activity has also led to a lot of avalanches of late in Himalayan region in the mountains of the world. So avalanches are also sometimes called snow slides. Right. That is one thing to remember. And remember, this is 30 to 45 degree slopes, which is looking into the areas for potential of the most avalanches. Right. And if it is 45 degree and above, obviously more avalanches. So very dense trees can help anchor these particular snow 
to steep slopes and prevent avalanches that is one aspect so if you want to prevent avalanches we need to have a shelter built plantation or something which is stopping it to follow so loose snow avalanche slab avalanche all these avalanches we have discovered earlier in our video so you can look into the disaster management playlist where you'll find the different types of avalanches with snow avalanche now further if you observe here is an information for you people who are aspirants that if you want to actually achieve it in 2025 so she has its programs which is listed here and you can go to the she in for details or number is also given on your screen so you can contact them i've given every detail in the description description of this video as well so if you are interested so you can take these courses from the website or you can connect with them directly now coming to the next topic this is our volcano so one question from volcano is also very common so if you observe volcanic eruptions different types of lava you know why volcanoes erupt these are the basic conceptual aspects but what question you observe here is basically coming from either types of volcano or is it coming from the examples? So largely composite volcano, also called stratovolcano, stratified volcanism. We have a detailed video anyway on volcanism on our YouTube channel. So you can watch that if you want more con conceptual part. But here we're looking into that what has happened around and which are the important ones. So if you observe Ojos del Salado, right? So Oyos del Salado is in Chile and it's the tallest composite volcano on earth. That's important. And here Mount Rainier in Washington also, you observe the tallest in the US, right? These are some of the examples. Then Mount Fuji in Japan, Mount Cotopaxi in Ecuador, Shasta in California, Hood in Oregon, and Mount St. Helens in Washington, right? So these are examples. And then you look into calderas, so which are the biggest ones. So volcano collapses into the void themselves, right? So huge opening. And we have crater lakes in caldera at many places right coming to the next is volcanic plugs which is called neck of a volcano so you can look into tough cones are also there also known as mars so tough cones are shallow flat floored craters that you observe here right lava plateaus obviously we have a deccan lava plateau as well and then you see columbia plateau and others then volcanic distribution map of the world you should definitely take a look into this ring of fire region of particular areas that you observe around Pacific and also this particular area because this is where more movement of late has been observed. So Eritrea, Ethiopia and the areas covering this particular Great Rift Valley could be one of the areas where something could be there. So look into Mayon Volcano here. So southeastern Luzon Strait, Philippines. So here is Luzon Strait between Philippines and Taiwan. And here is this area, Mayong Volcano, right? So check a look into this. And this is on Pacific Ring of Fire, Circum Pacific Belt. So this actually erupted and this is an active volcano, right? So its name is derived from local word for beautiful lady, right? That's how it gets its name, most perfect volcanic cone because of symmetry. So it's very symmetrical as well. And apart from this, you have earthquake always in the picture. So one thing from earthquake could also be available. So you can take into look into hypocenter, epicenter, fault plane, all these basic concepts once you can observe. And what is in interesting here, the causes of earthquake. So tectonics, of course, and then you have the inner seismic zones that we observe and earth shaking and trembling is very common and Turkish earthquake where what brought us to the news. So if you observe here, this area had a lot of earthquakes of late where you have tri-junctions, different boundaries, smaller plates as well and other plates as well. So looking into the plate tectonics map is very important. So if you observe the major plates, Eurasian plate, Australian plate, Indian plate, right? All these are the major plates here. You have Arabian plate, you have African plate, then you have South American plate, Caribbean plate, North American plate, then you have smaller plates like Cocos, Nazca. So Nazca's one boundary is on Pacific, one is on South America. Here Cocos is on Pacific, one is on the Mesoamerica, right? So here is another tri-junction if you observe. Juan de Fuca is here, right? So all these are now some of them north of equator and south of equator. So all those things you can remember in simple ways. And now here seismogram, seismograph, basic idea. So all these P wave and S wave we have discovered in our geomorphology discussions. But here again, it is given that something from here could be there, right? Now coming to cyclones. So cyclones have been more common, more occurrence have been found in an ocean as well and other oceans as well. Storm surge, flooding, extreme wind, tornadoes, these have been part of the news. So coming to characteristics of tropical cyclones, something could be there. So a list again has been prepared and given to you here. These are the characteristics of tropical cyclone, which are important to just take a revision. 
and different terminologies are important. So looking into some of the terminologies here, in Caribbean Sea, Gulf of Mexico, North Atlantic Ocean and Eastern and Central North Pacific, it's called hurricane. So they nearly, you know, Atlantic and Pacific region of the North. The North Pacific also, typhoon it is called. In Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea, it's called cyclone. And West Southern Pacific and Southeastern Indian Ocean, it's called severe tropical cyclone. In Southwest Indian Ocean, it's called tropical cyclone. So same thing, but different names. So you can take a look. And this is geographically given here. Now, classification of tropical cyclone. So tropical depression, storm. Then you have hurricane, typhoon, tropical cyclone. So here, 116 kilometer per hour or 63 knots is very important here. Now, naming of cyclones we have discussed in details we can go to our playlist in climatology section where things are given so here it will be helpful for you now looking into some important thing here like for example escap what is it so it's economic and social commission for asia and pacific panel right so here part of wmo it's there for the naming then if you observe here is another rsmc new delhi tropical cyclone center right so you can look into this center as well so these are certain things coming to tidal waves, gravity, moon's gravity, maximum, then sun and earth position. All these things are important here. So monthly tidal patterns and all those things are the basics. This is also important here. Now coming to heat waves. So heat waves, if you look into, this has been all over the news mostly. So one question you can identify from heat waves and here IMD's work, if you observe, classifies heat wave according to regions and their temperature ranges. So what about IMD? The number of heat wave days in India has increased from 413 over 1981 to 1990 to 600 and over 2011 to 2020, the last decade. So this is where heat waves are increasing. It's clear from IMD data itself. Now, what is the criteria? So just take a look into it because criteria based question can come. So heat wave is considered when the maximum temperature of a station reaches 40 degree. That's the first thing. And for plains, this is 40 degree and at least 30 degree for hilly region. So remember this 30 for hills, 40 for plain, then only heat waves is called for. And then further, if you observe an increase of 7 degree C or more from normal temperature is considered severe heat wave action. Right. So if normal is, say, 25 and if 32 is there, so it's like seven degree increase and that's called severe heat wave running. So first you need to know the benchmark. What is the average of the area? Right. So these are the things here. Then if you observe additionally, the actual maximum temperature remains 45 degrees C or more irrespective of normal maximum temperature. A heat wave is declared. And in 2016, National Disaster Management Authority issued a comprehensive guideline for heat waves and key strategies. So here, heat wave action plan, right, under Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, it was there. Then public awareness and early warning system where you can create shelters and heat proof shelters are very important. Access to drinking water and all these facilities. Then you have implementing climate action plan. So greening is very important in the cities, especially. Right, and looking into the tree plantations and nature-based solutions and sustainable cooling, that is passive cooling technology to create naturally vented buildings and look into the vital alternatives to address urban heat island effects and several others. Right, Then you have replacing darker roofs by lighter roofs and climate resilient crops. These are the actions here. Now coming to marine heat waves, if you observe. So marine heat waves are when you observe that there is an extreme warming of sea surface temperature that persists for days to months. So here you observe sea rises to three or four degrees Celsius above its average for at least five days. This is important. So here causes, you observe the global climate change and its effect is showing on. So winter warm spells are there sometimes. Then you have the ocean currents, so patches of warm ocean current and air sea heat flux that is there. And then you have abnormality in the wind and also the climate change and, you know, ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation, that is also very important. And what are the ecological impacts, if you observe? So habitat destruction is the first thing in ecology that we look into. Australia, Tasmania and all those areas you observe in Southeast Asia are facing a lot of problems because of this and coral bleaching is happening very fast loss of biodiversity that's a big thing happening here in great barrier reef and deoxygenation and acidification of the ocean and all those things linked together with overfishing leads to a lot of problems economic losses of course if there is a loss in biodiversity for fisheries and aquaculture problems and then after the ecosystem structure is 
not functioning properly there is an alteration so obviously it's affecting all others linked together so death of marine invertebrates and also leading to more endangered species right and el nino and la nina is one very important perennial topic please do watch the video in our climatology okay climatology playlist for el nino la nina and so and all those things that how it affects indian monsoon and what are the important things here so if you observe here carefully the duration of el nino and la nina comparison is here given right so several months here several months again impact on winds so it is weakening the trade winds hence why you have in el nino you have drought situation in asia africa right while in la nina you have flood situation so a basic brief comp comparison el nino and la nina is also given here for your reading if you want to just take a quick revision so weak monsoons el nino heavy and abnormal monsoons la nina remember that so this is something which you can remember and measuring cycles is also given here so ocean nino index oni and soi right southern oscillation index so ocean component of el nino southern oscillation index is called only oni right oceanic nino index it tracks departure from average sea temperature and also looks into the quantifying of intensity and duration of el nino and la nina events and based on rolling three month average of sea surface temperature and then you have soi which is very common index quantifies difference in air pressure so here is pressure and here is temperature that you can remember at least rest negative and positive soi so what is positive soi it means that higher pressure in eastern pacific lower pressure in western pacific negative soi basically means the opposite of it means lower pressure in eastern pacific on the peru coast and higher pressure on western pacific right so you can observe this pressure difference here and that's why enso is very important to look into so this is for today and further we'll be moving into more topics and so this much revision of these topics and also the links that i have provided in description is helpful to you i hope and also if you have not watched the videos on climatology and geomorphology topics glacier globes and these topics are again going to be important one or two questions are coming from this topic so i'll see you for the next video and get ready with the series best wishes keep sharing keep learning take care